Hello. This is a video lecture for History 1302. And this lecture will talk about the impact of the Vietnam War on American society here at home. Many of you have been coming to class and hearing of what the Vietnam War was about. Many of you should understand that it was, to some extent, an extension of this Cold War and the attempt to stop the spread of communism. Um, what I'd like to talk about today is the impact that this war has on American society here at home. Um, one of the biggest gambles that LBJ had uh, in going into Vietnam was that American public opinion generally favored some sort of intervention um, in the early days. In 1964, over 70% of Americans believed that the United States should do something in Southeast Asia with respect to the spread of communism. But if you were with us the last time we met, and you know what the Tet Offensive was, and you know how that changed public opinions, um, you'll, you'll understand what the credibility gap was. Uh, I don't know if you remember me talking about Walter Cronkite, but Walter Cronkite in the 1960s was America's newsman. Anyway, um, when he left his desk, uh, to go into the field and report directly from the front lines. Uh, basically what he said was that the American people had been lied to by their government, the war was going exceptionally poorly, and although we weren't on the brink of defeat, we, we were a long way from the victory that Johnson and the Secretary of Defense, Robert McNamara, had promised uh, in the earlier part of that war. At any rate, what this does is it gives rise to the credibility gap and that is worth writing down. Credibility gap, the concept that the government was lying to the American people, or at the very, very least, not being completely truthful to them or with them with respect to how the war was going. And its lasting impact on American politics and American life is this general tr distrust of the government. It's almost an assumption that the government is not acting in the interest of the people, it's acting in the interests of itself. And as you probably will be able to see throughout the rest of our course, this idea doesn't go away anytime soon. Now, what we're going to be talking about here momentarily is the anti-war movement that this credibility gap gave rise to. Um, one, of the, one of the institutions that we were talking about when we were discussing the New Left was Students for a Democratic Society. SDS. Um, you'll remember that the two things that SDS really wanted to see happen was an end to these old rigid Cold War policies that were getting us closer and closer to what they perceived to be as nuclear annihilation and an end to the old customs, the old social norms such as segregation. Oh, okay. So all across uh, college campuses, students for a democratic society were protesting things. For example, at the University of California at Berkeley, there was a massive student protest that uh, was protesting what they felt, student protest that is, what they felt uh, to be an infringement on the First Amendment right of free speech. But as the war in Vietnam continued to escalate, what you saw was SDS getting more and more proactive with respect to trying to get ROTCs off of college and uh, university campuses, uh, expose university institutions or major corporations that were benefiting from the war. But most importantly, what SDS organized in 1967 was to stop the draft week. It was a massive outpouring in Washington where SDS basically marched on Washington. Uh, young men burned their draft cards and it was again calling out more and more attention to the fact that some people felt that there was something fundamentally wrong with trying to force democracy on a group of individuals that um, had their own take with respect to the political system that they wanted. It's rare that I ask you to commit a date to your notes. Um, however, 1968 really is an exception. 68 is an incredibly, incredibly important year in American history. 1968 is an election year. And um, as I alluded to the last time we met, it's, a, it's an election that Johnson believes he cannot win, so he resigns and says that he's not going to seek a second term in office. 
And what this does is it, is it really opens up a, an important debate within the Democratic Party. Now, remember, in our class, the Democratic Party has been the, power of the, the, been the party of the majority, the party of power, ever since Franklin Roosevelt's election of 1932. That's going to begin to change in 1968, and this is why. There were two factions that you need to know about within the Democratic Party. One was your peace Democrats. In other words, individuals that believed that the war in Vietnam was wrong and America needed to get out. And then you had your uh, war Democrats. And of course, as the name impl implies, these were individuals that wanted to stay the course in Vietnam. In 1968, the leading candidate for uh, the presidential nomination on the Democratic side was the vice president under Lyndon Johnson, Hubert Humphrey. Humphrey was not liked by SDS or the Peace Democrats, primarily because he sought to finish what we had begun in Vietnam. At any rate, um, dissatisfied with the, the Democrats' nomination of Humphrey, uh, major factions of the Democratic Party marched out into the streets, which just so happened to be held in Chicago that year. The, the convention was in Chicago that year. They marched out into the streets, and what took place in the aftermath of this was described as a police riot. What you're really talking about was the police in Chicago beating up the protesters while the camera crews beamed this into every living room set in the world, not just in the United States, but throughout the world. Now, this becomes known as the Siege of Chicago, uh, for your notes, the Siege of Chicago. But the really significant factor that this does is it demonstrates, it's worth writing down, it demonstrates that this New Deal Democratic Voting Coalition is beginning to break up. It's really the beginning of the end for the Democrats when it comes to being the party of power. Now, another impact that the War of in, uh, Vietnam had in American life was that it radicalized the civil rights movement. I want you to think about the hypocrisy of this for a second. I mean, young men are being asked to go 10,000 miles away from home and fight a war for freedom and democracy. But we've talked about these issues before. Is there freedom and democracy here in Selma, Alabama, Oakland, California, Detroit, Michigan, Montgomery, Alabama? money Mississippi. So in a lot of instances the answer was firmly no. Um, one of the places that realizes this directly was the Watts Ghetto uh, of Los Angeles. And in 1965 what happened in Watts was another one of these what was called a police riots. Really what you're talking about is what historians refer to as the urban uprising. In the mid to late 1960s, these urban ghettos, including Watts, erupted in violence, uh, several days of rioting, and the basic premise behind this was that there's economic oppression inside those cities. We've talked about the urban crisis, and we talked how, how all these poor people were generally concentrated into the inner depths of the cities, and not a lot of attention was paid or efforts were made with respect to improving their day-to-day -day lives. At the same time, these are individuals that are being drafted left and right, being sent over to Vietnam and coming back in pieces, coming back uh, in body bags, and uh, it began to be quite a bit for people to bear. So the Watts Ghetto is the worst, or excuse me, the Watts Riot is the worst riot in economic um, um, sense of the word in American history right up until 1967 when Newark erupted in a racial violence. In Newark, New Jersey, a police officer arrested a man for uh, an illegal pass, whatever that means. Uh, he was passing somebody in his car, and apparently he violated a traffic uh, uh, ordinance. At any rate, um, when they stopped him, pulled him out, uh, they beat him within an inch of his life, and this is entire, in front of the entire black community. So three days of rioting and arrest ensued. The same thing happens in Detroit a few months later, 1967. Uh, Detroit becomes the most destructive riot in American history up until 1992 when it was replaced by the Rodney King riots. At any rate, Newark and Detroit erupted for the same reasons that Watts erupted. Economic oppression, institutionalized harassment by what was perceived as a white police force inflicting its will on an African American community. All the while, people are being asked to go and serve in Vietnam. So for your notes,
what these urban rebellions were, were not only uh, uh, riots within the city, they, they were more or less protesting uh, the conditions of those ghettos at the same time that they were protesting unfair treatment in the war in Vietnam. You should be mindful that this is not just a black and white dichotomy. We talked about Chavez and Yorta. Uh, we've talked about the making of the Chicano movement. Um, in the late 1960s, uh, especially in the West, uh, people of Mexican-American descent uh, formed themselves into a social movement of their own. Now, this is called the Chicano movement. And as we've mentioned before, in class, this is not simply Mexican-Americans lobbying for their rights or protesting segregation in one form or fashion. This is about an empowerment movement of a group of people that had been um, oppressed in some way, shape, or form. Let me give you, let me give you a, little, a little example. There was a guy from uh, Colorado, and his name was Rudolfo, or as he was known, Corky Gonzalez. And what Gonzalez did is he put together the Crusade for Justice. Now, this is worth writing down next to the Chicano movement. The Crusade for Justice was very similar to what Martin Luther King wanted to see happen in, uh, in Birmingham. In other words, teachers within the Chicano community hired for uh, Chicano-led schools, uh, more Chicano-owned businesses, in short, uh, the empowerment of the Chicano community throughout those western uh, enclaves. The same thing was true from a man from South Texas named uh, Reyes Lopez Tijerina, who was quite disturbed by this erosion of Mexican-American land rights that we were talking about when we first began this class in the late 19th century. So Gonzalez and Tijerina are bringing light to these issues of economic oppression, how that leads to not only racism and racial inequality, but economic inequality. Now, all the while that it seems like the wheels are coming off the cart, so to speak, with respect to civil rights, Martin Luther King is back in the East, and he's quite concerned that the civil rights movement has taken a turn for the, the, the more radical, and by radical he meant violent. What King wanted to demonstrate in 1968 was that nonviolence could still work, that the, that the movement did not have to betray its core values in order to bring about civil rights. So what Johnson does in 1968 is two things, and they're both worth writing now. One, Martin Luther King publicly broke with Lyndon Johnson with respect to supporting him in the war in Vietnam. Um, he, he pretty much said it's very hypocritical for a government to send its citizens 10,000 miles away from home when there's plenty of economic, political, social inequality right here at home. Uh, this was a big deal considering that Lyndon Johnson had been King's biggest ally, at least on the political level, as far as the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Great Society, the War on Poverty. Those were things that directly benefited the movement. Now, the other thing that King does in 1968, again, you're hearing 68 over and over again. Anyway, in 1968, he got together with several leaders within the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, in particular, a woman by the name of Marion Wright. And what they came up with was a concept known as the Poor People's March to Washington. Now, the Poor People's March, it's exactly what it sounds like it is. What King wanted to demonstrate was that poverty was not just a black issue. It wasn't just a white issue. It was an American issue. And he felt that it was inexcusable that the richest country in the history of man should have this type of grinding poverty. But more than anything else, what he wanted to do was bring all people, regardless of race or ethnicity, together and have them literally march to Washington to demonstrate to the government the, the pressing need for economic reforms to address the issue of poverty in America. Now, there's a hiccup along the way, and that hiccup is in Memphis, Tennessee, where the sanitation workers, the garbage men, had gone out on strike. Now, the reason that the sanitation workers were striking uh, were, were very emblematic of what King had in mind with respect to the Poor People's March. They were grossly underpaid. Uh, they worked in just terrible conditions. As a matter of fact, one of the last straws uh, that uh, convinced the, the sanitation workers to strike was that uh, uh, a man was crushed to death in his garbage truck. Anyway, 
The city of Memphis refused to recognize their union, and the sanitation workers reached out to MLK and asked them to come to, or him to come to Memphis to lead demonstrations to convince the city to recognize the union. Well, uh, this had been something that had been feared by the local town fathers in Memphis because they understood what a controversial figure King was, and they had seen Watts, they had seen Detroit, and they didn't want that happening in Memphis. So they forbade him from marching. Now, what happens in the aftermath of the city government saying you cannot march was a riot broke out. And this was the first time in the history of, of, of MLK's activism that his demonstrators had resorted to violence. Um, think about Birmingham. Think about Selma. I mean, as oppressive as those were, the, the demonstrators didn't resort to violence. This bugged King. It, it really, really bothered him, considering considering he, he, he wanted to demonstrate that nonviolence could work in the first place. Several weeks later, he flew back into Memphis, and together with the Reverend Jesse, Jesse Jackson and several other SCLC activists, they were able to get the injunction to prevent them from marching, thrown out, and the march was scheduled for the following day. Now, King was on the balcony of the Lorraine Hotel where he was staying, and he was ready to address the crowd, but a man in the crowd named James Earl Ray assassinated Martin Luther King. So another one reason that 68 is such an important year is because the face of the movement, the man that was keeping the wheels on the cart and everything together, at the same time that things are becoming more and more violent in the civil rights movement, that guy's gone. You need to take into consideration how significant that is, that the civil rights movement is a leaderless movement. Now, King's supporters vowed to make his dream a reality and, 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 and have the poor people's march to Washington be a real achievement. Now, this happens. All those poor people from every corner of the country eventually make it into Washington later on in 1968. But King's assassination had taken so much of a wind out of their sail that nobody really noticed. As a matter of fact, the only politician, significant politician, that, that took notice was a guy from Massachusetts named Robert F. Kennedy, RFK. The name ought to sound familiar, but you should remember Robert from uh, the days of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, to some extent, uh, he was the Attorney General um, uh, during the, the early 1960s, especially with the Freedom Rights. Anyway, Martin, uh, this, this had a profound impact on RFK. And in 1968, he declared his eligibility as the Democratic candidate for president. And he ran on an anti-war, anti-poverty, pro-civil rights platform. Now, for reasons that I don't have a lot of time to get into, Kennedy was a polarizing candidate with respect to his Middle East policy. We're talking about a time period that Israel is a brand new country. And if you follow the news today, you understand that there are several countries within the Middle Eastern region that don't like Israel very much, primarily because of land rights. Long story short, Robert Kennedy said that he supported Israel's right to exist. One individual that didn't like this very much was a Middle Eastern man named Sirhan Sirhan, who unloaded a pistol in Kennedy's chest in 1968 after he had just won the California primary. The significance of this, first of all, is happening again in 1968, another political assassination. But the real significance is, after Martin Luther King died, Robert Kennedy, even though he was a white man, Robert Kennedy became the face of the movement because he was taking up the causes that were near and dear to uh, King's heart. So this is a very significant time period, it's a very crucial time period, considering all the things that we've got going on. Vietnam. Uh, social unrest at home, civil rights unrest here at home. The impact. What I need you to understand about the impact of this period is you're seeing the breaking apart of that Democratic voting coalition. Think about it. From 1932 until this period, 1968, not only had the Democrats generally been in charge, their agenda had set the agenda for the most part. I mean, even Dwight Eisenhower, who was a Republican, pretty much signed off on the liberal approach to the post-war economy. That's beginning to change. And the other thing that 68 does 
is it opens the door for somebody who thought that his political career was dead, and that's Richard Nixon. And that's where we'll pick it up.